Hello, my name is Dr. Millet from Law and Legal Studies Department at Calton University. So uh, we are November 7 today, 2016. I'm here to do a quick follow-up on uh, the ATPN interview uh, which I had a few weeks ago and the show was here on November 4, 2016 and uh, the show was APTN Investigates and the question was about essentially is there any Eastern Métis or Métis in the Maritimes? Mainly I am uh, motivated to do this today because I've shared with the main reporter more than six and seven historical quotes with the reference which I thought were great to share in terms of getting this conversation off the ground in terms of history. When we speak of the Western Métis, for example, we often refer to their stories and histories, and rightfully so. And then we understand <clears throat> a little bit more what these people are all about, and uh, the struggles that they had, and, and much more. So, um, today I want to do this, the same thing, which I think seems fair, by sharing those quotes that were not shared on the show, probably for a reason of space, perhaps of interest, it's hard to know, but I think that many people will find these, these evidence useful to their history, and it may also enable us to go in another direction. So this is why I've suggested to Mr. Todd Lemiron to go with historical quotes to reframe the debate in terms of evidence and rational discussion rather than polemics and rhetorics uh, that I find are often empty. But um, it seems that uh, the show did favor two of my tweets uh, in which um, I mentioned, and I'm going to talk about them right off the bat, you know, so hopefully to provide a little bit more insights and also uh, by showing tweets and other comments that makes more precise the context and the background in which these tweets were made. Often hard exchanged and hard comments from the other side. So my first tweet that I'm going to show at the screen right now goes like this. I tweeted a year and a half ago, so a cannibal to Métis communities and kins that claims you, absolutely. A cannibal to prairie-centric nationalist Métis Gestapo, not so much. Now, the discussion that surrounded that tweet was about, and I think it's still valuable today as a discussion, it was about communities. And it was a discussion that we had on Twitters between different people that you should be accountable to the community that claims you and the kinship systems that you have. And I agree with this. I agree with this. But often communities are now instrumentalized in such a way that they are used by numbers of scholars and actors out there to suggest that you have no communities, no historical communities, no history. Therefore, your identity and the genuity or the way you speak about yourself will not be legitimate, right? That yes, you should be accountable to your community, to your history, to your kins, in terms of authenticity, that's for sure. But the question of authenticity go off the rail when it is made to police individuals and even communities on the ground from some kind of sociological debates altogether that would be top-down, imposing top-down criteria that are imagined to enforce what would be a rightful community, what would be a legitimate identity. Furthermore, when these criteria are from somebody from another community that would police your community in terms of authenticity, then I find this extremely, uh, extremely disturbing. And in that context, the comments that are made to people from other Métis community across the country, from the numbers of actors out there that are very vocal, are types of comments such as, first, they're, they trigger you by asking, who are you? probing in your identity, and you try your best to answer. And then you're being told that you're lying to yourself, 
you're lying about your heritage, they downplay your heritage, they make it less meaningful due to various historical contexts. They can also imply that your ancestors were lying to themselves or lying to others, which are really hurtful comments for a number of people out there, including the youth that are increasingly caught within those discussion. Now, in, in an academic setting, that use those massive accusations across the board. People feel, you know, that their heritage is being downplayed and hurt. And on the other hand, you have individuals that are taking that narrative to bully others. So, both hands are suffering from that discussion, either being bullied or being bullied. So I truly believe that we need an alternative to that discussion altogether, and this is why I suggest that we need to go for evidence-based discussion, rational, kind discussion, as much as we can, and generous in terms of their interpretation. So <clears throat> this is why I have suggested and uh, a number of quote, a number of like you know evidence that I've shared with Todd Lemuron that there are evidence that the Eastern Métis were calling themselves or being called Métis out east. And these evidence, you know, historically speaking, goes back to 1760. And I'll show them in a minute with you, sharing them with you, six or seven evidence that will show that even per the grammar used by a number of sociologists, including, for example, Dr. Chris Anderson, that suggests that if you don't have those markers, you don't qualify as a legitimate people, which I think is a very, very dangerous argument to get off the ground. I mean, this argument was used, historically speaking, to downplay indigenous people all across the world. First, by European society that decided that you were not civilized enough, not historical enough, not legitimate enough to be a civilization. Now we have these discussions that goes that, you know, accuse you of being looking for an ancestor only 200 years ago and claim that this is, this is the problem on the one hand, which I think is a straw man. Clearly, uh, from all the people that I've met around the country in my travel, people always refer to themselves as culture. And although it's true that for a lot of Métis, the basic denominators of all the Métis is somehow, empirically speaking, the presence of indigenous ancestor, or else we're not talking about indigeneity at all. We're talking about something else. But if we're talking about indigeneity, then among the Métis, it seems to be that the main denominator would be an indigenous ancestor, be it by script, that could be easily to, you know, close to 200 years ago, or ancestor that are notified into um, BMS, birth and marital or sepulture certificates that shows that these people were Métis, identify them as Métis. Now we can criticize this as all this being made by the government and then go into a scheme that says the government wanted to rationalize our identity. That may be the case that we have a lot of issues with racial denominations, but nevertheless, Miti culture, per the evidence that we have, even including the writings of Louis Riel, or Nicolas Chatelain, or other Miti leader that did sign treaties, not only in the West, but also in Ontario, are showing that their indigenous heritage is not only valued, but is claimed in order to base their indigeneity. But you see at the same time, especially in the writings of Louis Riel, that the European, the so-called uh, white heritage, is also valued uh, to make this culture unique in its coming together. Now some people will say that this downplays the term of the nation and the political identities of the Métis to make it only about a race or a mixing or some kind of sub-product. I would suggest that this idea is not necessarily the case. The political project of Louis Riel wished to unite all people across 
nor America, as this evidence that I'm showing right now to you clearly show. Louis Riel was making a distinction between the all North of America and even the role of Gabriel Dumont to be the leader of the Northwest, meaning that he clearly understood that they were Métis all across North America, including that were different from the Northwestern Métis. That now, you know, framed their identity from that time onward in terms of nation or nationhood. Arguably, for a lot of other Métis, nationhood meant something differently. Different, I should say. For a lot of people, Métis nation meant a kind of process of self-recognition and recognizing others as well from similar backgrounds, similar experience, not necessarily the same, but a common struggle, political struggle, that tried to unite so-called half-breed, barbarily, chico, Métis, from all across North America. Arguably, it could be suggested that this was a project of the real. And again, I have this quote for you that says that we real clearly understood that there were Métis in the East provinces of Canada, as this quote showed clearly in his writing of 1885. And for the record, I don't cherry pick my evidence, I find them where I find them, which means in books. Obviously, these quotes can be sometimes in French, try to translate them as best as I can, and I can understand that for a number of scholars out there that don't master French, these quotes could be difficult to access. But once they're presented to the academic community, one would hope that this bring in other types of conversation altogether. So, you've seen those two quotes now, and um, hopefully we can get on the substance of those two quotes. Not out of context, but basically to suggest that there's a larger history than what we think. And now we are seeing something very different in a conversation happening, as we have witnessed it on the show, for example. And I'm going to highlight two or three of these problems. Um, but before I do so, allow me to comment my second tweet that was aired on APTN on November 4th. Uh, I was not <laughs> told that this one would be on, but that's fine. And that uh, basically allows me to speak to that subject in even more greater detail, so I'm grateful for it, in fact. Uh, second tweet that I'm going to show on the screen right now goes like this. Let us not forget that without lateral violence, colonialisms can hardly operate. Take note, Miti leader in Ottawa. So, this quote answers to the problem of colonial societies. In that tweet, I was highlighting that in a lot of different colonial societies, colonizers have used the colonized people and different schemes and different form of social organization to play different games of truth or different games of privileges one against the other. And this is highly dangerous for the colonized people as it, you know, stall their struggles to emancipate from a colonizing model. But it also suggests that what we are witnessing right now in terms of Métis identity and all the discussions on it and the accusation on it, that we're going seemingly into that direction. I think that all of Métis leaders should take note of the fact that we can be instrumentalized into our struggles one against the other to suggest that you know on the one hand the so-called juridical power test for the Miti is not good enough and it's colonizing on the other hand you'll find individuals that suggest that oh well these Miti never made the cut 
for the palate juridical test, hence they are not Métis. So a lot of Métis out east, out west, out north are finding themselves now in a situation in which they have to prove since at least 1982, but moreover since 2003, since the test has been formulated in the Supreme Court of Canada to say who are Métis per the Constitution, Article 35. A lot of people are essentially awakening to the fact that they have to organize themselves in such a way not to disappear. Now, on the one hand, they face a juridical framework that imposed them a number of criteria to define themselves outside of their own assessment of their culture in many ways. And on the other hand, these Métis are now facing a group of Métis, an organization, created out of, a, out of fighting around precisely the constitutional era, a group that have created themselves out west and that now claim that they are the only right bearers of Métis identity and that all other Métis are actually fraud or, you know, wrong about their identity or they are instrumentalizing that METI term to uh, have benefits, to go after the so-called Indians benefit, like tax break, which I disagree entirely with on a number of terms. And privileges I've seen rarely among all the METI that I've came across across the country. Most METI are seeking these rights in order to get their proper recognition in terms of identity, that would be A, and B, to secure a number of practices such as harvesting that would secure their cultural way of life in their region per their own identity. Um, sadly, this tweet was <laughs> instrumentalized to suggest that I was attacking Métis nationalisms per se, and making comparison to slavery, uh, which when you look at the tweet, you gotta ask yourself, how can someone go at such length to suggest this meaning? But that aside, it did trigger a number of response by individuals, you know, that when for, you know, ad hominem attack, or others that may impugnate motives. Uh, and we see this discussion, increasingly violent, viral on the internet. And I, for one, have decided that I will not be mute by these kinds of discussion, and I will try to answer it as best I, as I can, by evidence, by rational argument, but also by defending other people in the background that are getting bullied by these arguments that are not new. I mean, we've seen we Riel, for example, answering this white ethnicity type of argument in 1885. Riel is only clear about this probing of meaty people as white, as never perfect enough, as not indigenous enough, as not worthy enough. But we see also that Riel answer in this passage as what is the heritage of the Miti people? What is the ethnical combination of the Miti people? What is the historical background, which arguably is the fear trade per the definition that we real suggest the Miti are? And let me be clear here. Nationalisms per se is no problem. If you take nationalisms, in my opinion, owning what you are, Building with your kins and with your communities are as much as you can and you do the best out of everything you can and you build bridges to make a better world. It seems to me fair. But when that nationalism is, is instrumentalized to lead to us versus them in ways that are becoming increasingly violent, and police other people in terms of authenticity and downplay the heritage of other people. Along this line, I think that this is a very dangerous form of nationalism that we have to check 
and avoid as much as we can. And this type of nationalisms in terms of media identity is now in the open, right? As we can find it in the book, for example, of Dr. Chris Anderson at page six of his book, Meet T, that suggests, I'm showing it on the screen, if the individual or group lacks a connection to the historical core of their Red River region, it is not Meet T, in a quote. So we can see what type of exclusivism attached to a word, that per evidence was nevertheless shared across the country in different contexts, meant different things for different people. A history is still in movement though, by which people are claiming back their culture. In many cases, not only East, but I've seen a number of people out West coming back to their heritage that have been suppressed for various reasons in the family, including people in the, Mar you know, in the Maritimes for sure, but also people that I've met in Alberta. And there's records showing that even elders in Alberta will be clear to you that the term Métis was not used for their generation. That the term, rather, used was French to either process the identity or to be strategical about it in terms of the need to hide indigenous identity. And let me be clear about this too. I realize that a lot of people didn't pay the same price for their indigeneity in the same way. And so we don't have to make a flat approach to all indigenous identity and questions. We don't have also to be fearful of one another in terms of these identity, would be my suggestion. Nevertheless, you can read Dr. Chris Anderson saying in his book, Meet Thee, and I quote, the category Métis is not a sub-kitchen for indigenous individuals and communities disenfranchised in various ways by the Canadian state, and a quote at page 24 of his book. Again, you can see how this kind of language downplays the heritage of the other Métis as a soup kitchen. Um, and we can see how problematic that is in terms of the youth that are and the elders that are trying to rebranch in many ways their heritage in various communities that, mind you, the government of Canada, per evidence, have attempted to destroy all terms of collective collectiveness, have attempted to destroy the collectivities of Métis where they could find them. Hence their instrumentalization of individual solution for the Métis, the script, or refusing treaties uh, in certain case, or getting Miti out of treaties, refusing present to the Miti, and not allowing them to join any type of reserves in certain parts of Canada. So that history has to be taken into account and not just brushed aside and say, well, these Miti that are coming back now because you may not know of them are instrumentalizing our identity, our culture, our symbols, and everything else. I mean, um, and this was uh, seen in the APTN interview on November 4, for example, when Dr. Adam Godry stated during the show that other Métis, you know, referring to the Eastern Métis, were using, and I quote him, our terminology, which is now enshrined in law, impugnating again motives, right, the Eastern Métis that they only want to get that Métis card in order to have benefit, advantage, stealing the identity, cultural appropriation of the Western Miti. Now you can see that this type of arrogation, wanting to claim the term Miti for oneself only, is problematic in terms of historical evidence. I've tried to suggest a number of these evidence on my Twitter account, Facebook discussion, but rapidly enough I had to block a number of conversation because they were not engaging with the evidence, but rather at a minimum attack, trying to, you know, attack the person or downplay uh, the heritage of the Midwest, for example, for reasons still obscure to me, when clearly um, a number of evidence show that a lot of community, Métis and half-breed community, historically existed in the Midwest, and I see no reason why they should be blocked of valuing their heritage. It's theirs, after all. So, and the reason provided for 
um, Adam Godry in that regard is clear in his interview. And I quote, they are aspiring to become Miti on the scale that the Miti nation is, even though there is no history for it. So again, you see that there is no history for the other Miti, according to Dr. Godry. I find that comment very disturbing in a sense that to prove that other indigenous people don't have history, it should the onus should be on that person, not on the person that receives the accusation. But again, that seems to be not the case. We can suggest that other media across Canada don't have histories, and we don't consider the fact that they had injured colonialisms as as any other indigenous people had to a different degree, for sure, to different circumstances and outcome, but mainly that a lot of Métis communities and family were essentially destroyed. So this is why, quickly now, uh, I wanted to share with you some of the evidence uh, that I have on the Acadian Métis, uh, just as an exercise, uh, just to suggest to you that uh, actually there, there are a number of historical evidence, and that is just the tip of the iceberg in which um, Miti, per different names sometimes, also have existed in the Maritimes. Um, and let me remind you that different names was also used out west and in Ontario to define what was called in the United States the French Indians, for example. So the first quote that I'm putting on the top here is um, a quote uh, that you can find in John No, 1914. And if you look at the bottom of it, you see that this goes back to 1760, and it clearly identified a hundred individuals forming different families. You see them identified as Michifs. So not only Miti, but the word Michif was used in that regard. So for the people that says that the word Miti can never be found, and it never existed out east, and Michif was only use out of um, the West, clearly per evidence that's not the case. So, you know, we would need to move on to another set of argument. Then another quote that I'm showing right now on the board from Rameau that uh, goes back to 1888 and says that, in fact, Bois Brûlé, another familiar word, was used out in the Maritimes. This word you can find it back in, for example, the Song of Falcon, when the Battle of Seven Hawk is won. Falcon identified the winners as the Bois Brûlé. You can also find the term Bois Brûlé in the Book of Tugville, uh, going uh, in uh, present-day Ontario and the Great Lakes, identifying people that self-identified as Bois Brûlé, which meant, uh, per Alexis de Tugville, famous author, uh, the son of a Canadian and a so-called woman Indian. Uh, again, showing the distinctiveness of their ethnicity, but an identity that is not reducible to ethnicity. I need to really make that clear. That ethnicity is part of a culture. When it is valued by an individual and by a community, it's certainly part of a culture. When a political project that should be thought as imminent to that cultural identity is voiced, then it becomes a policy, a political expression of that culture. But we cannot in my understanding, reduce uh, the uh, indigeneity of Miti people to political events in certain part of the country. Um, other Miti have experienced themselves otherwise in different parts of the country, per evidence that we find. So here this quote describe um, the Bois Brûlé present in the Maritimes in terms of a general quarter in La Hève, right? So La Hève becomes a general quarter, which means that the identification is collective and distinctive. Distinctive from Mi'kmaq and the so-called white race, which is in the quote there in French. Another quote that I have translated this time for you is Rameau in a colony Feodad in 1989. That's described the Miti people as forming a small people. And I quote, 
colonial institution in emergence where one lived out later a small people, a new French province beyond the ocean. Several of his companions has indeed formed with so-called Indian squaw, a regular household giving rise to meaty families which spread on the east coast, and that would be of Acadia. So again, we can see that the Miti are not only identified as, you know, a random individual of a certain racial marker, and that now Akkadian would abuse that later on. Miti are described in Lahev as forming a small people, a Bois Brule headquarters. Uh, people identify them as, you know, identical in terms of the name that they use to other Bois Brule and Miti across the country, and Michif, including. Now, later on, you will find another important uh, historical figure, uh, De Brise, in his History of Lunenburg in 1895, saying exactly, again, the same thing, identified in the quote that you see now on your screen, identified Miti from La Heve. So a collective and distinctive identification in La Heve again, and you see in the quote that it's distinct from the Mi'kmaq of Chibuktu. So clearly there seems to be a distinction between, at the very least, some white settlers that could come from other places such as Boston, and Mi'kmaq people uh, that lives in uh, these areas. But if that would not be enough, then I show you an article here, a uh, newspaper clip from 1886 from Morning Chronicles. Now there's more to it, there's at least five different articles like that, but this one identifies the Miti Acadien, per name, rioting because they're lacking food. So clearly under a certain kind of political crisis, by which their leaders are attacking food supply in order to survive, seemingly. And it is reported, and these people are described as the descendant of Acadian and Mi'kmaq, hence they are distinctive from those two communities, and they are held as a community living in Paspispiak in 1886. And it is asked, one year after the hanging of the Riel, mind you, which are difficult times for Miti communities across the country, or half-breeds everywhere. So the Miti out east uh, are under uh, also the threat of being policed, and the military is sometimes asked to perhaps participate to subdue their rebellion. I'm, seeing, I'm showing you out to you another evidence that goes in the same direction, where it's in French, but, you know, uh, you can see that uh, there's a description that says La difficulté est soulevée par les Métis, qui sont des descendants d'Acadiens et de Mi'kmaq. And they are distinguishing these people from the English and the French, to which the authority doesn't want the police to be confused about, you know, in that region of Canada, not to hurt them, presumably. So the distinctions are clear and made. Now, some people have said to me that, oh, Sebastian Millet is only, you know, getting out dusty cherry-picked evidence uh, in order to sustain this type of discourse. Well, arguably, I would reverse the onus on these guys to do research prior to negating the heritage of other indigenous people across the country. And look, for example, at this example, um, the National Telegraph, you can see on the screen, of uh, Wednesday, January 12, 1977. That clearly show that uh, Métis were active in the maritime in 1977, so prior to Constitution, prior Paule, and Métis are held distinct from non-status, so-called Indians. Hence, if they were only non-status people in the maritimes, you wouldn't have the additions of Métis, which are held by a number of family as part of their distinct identity. And we have to get to the bottom of that question. What would be that distinct identity outside nationalistic articulation of that identity in specific contexts, such as in Red River, for example, uh, if my Miti identity is not reducible to that. And again, I don't see nationalism as a problem per se, in terms of expression if it's building on positive things or regional affirmations. We can see a number of different Miti, Miti from Northwestern territories, Miti from Ontario, from the West, from Manitoba, from Saskatchewan, from Alberta, from different places, from the Maritimes, all kinds of Métis. So I don't see any problems in affirming 
one media identity per region and even have a closed membership, if one wishes, per these particularities. But I would suggest that the only thing that we would need is to be more precise in terms of that METI heritage. Nobody needs to arrogate the term METI in and of itself, no more than the so-called Indians per the Constitution of 1982. A community would say we're the only one that fit that word Indian in the Constitution of 1982, or the Inuits for that matter. So the question is, why would a group of Miti out west and a number of scholars bandwagon with that argument to suggest the same, en passant, hurting other people and downplaying their heritage, calling them fraud, white, confused about their heritage, either through very strange argument that these people are only after ancestor 200 years ago. I mean. Uh, this is uh, truly problematic. Here you can see another evidence on the screen from 1984 that shows continuity of their activities uh, in the Maritimes in terms of METI. And it goes with the letter that I'm showing here from METI leader Harry Daniels that did negotiate for the METI uh, during the Constitution negotiations that have led to uh, the METI to be inserted in the Constitution of 1982. So Harry Daniels here, you can see it on the screen, was adamant that the term Métis was not to be, you know, uh, contained to a specific geographical area. It makes no sense to that. And Harry Daniel, I quote him, the notion that uh, being that self-identity is a right that cannot be usurpated by any means. It was also understood that the term Métis was not tied to any particular geographic area, keeping in mind that Aboriginal people from coast to coast to coast identify with the term Métis as their way of relating to the world, end of quote. So you can see here that clearly Harry Daniels was not fond of that kind of West only, East only, North only, better than you meet he. It makes no sense. And in the second, in this quote that I'm showing you from Louis Riel, you can see Louis Riel here blessing all the Miti people from um, all places, including French Canadian Miti, but also Miti of all origins. So Louis Riel was clearly, clearly understood that there were Miti all over the country including in the East provinces, like I've discussed it earlier, in which he plainly recognized that these Métis have equal right than those Métis out west in Manitoba. Uh, equal right means they don't have the right of those Métis. I mean, per, per the Manitoba Act, I mean, other Métis that didn't go into Manitoba uh, prior to a certain date cannot claim any land based so clearly, we shouldn't make we shouldn't make any mistakes on this. But Louis Riel did recognize that these Miti out east have similar rights. So hence, he was making the distinction: there's Miti in Manitoba, and there's Miti elsewhere. If Louis Riel could make that distinction, I wonder why a number of scholars that now claim to no media identity, so much so to police all individuals across this country in terms of what would be authentic or not authentic in terms of media identity, in terms of collectivities, but also in terms of individuals, um, is a very strange question to me. So, um, so that would be uh, it in terms of the evidence that I have to present to you and in terms of uh, the question. Now, with those evidence, we can challenge Dr. Godry's assertion that these people don't have history uh, or that they're using our terminology per, per se. I mean, clearly, this seems to be not the case. Per the evidence, these historical terms were used in different regions, including in the Maritimes. And so there's, a, in my opinion, a reason, a background for Kadiamiti to claim back these words and invigorate their identity. I thank you for your time, and please uh, don't hesitate to uh, visit my Twitter page at uh, MeTSab or to communicate with me by other means. Thank you very much, and you have a wonderful day. Thank you.